on a motorcycle. I don't know the science of this. Lightning. Oh my god! But you lived! This is Alan Carl, World Rider, and welcome to my YouTube channel. You're not gonna even believe what we've got cooking today. This guy right here, this dude, Chris Foster, for those of you who know, and on Instagram, Planet Earth Quest, and we're gonna talk a little bit about Planet Earth and his quest just in a minute. But look at this, this beautiful machine. What kind of motorcycle are we looking at, Chris? Uh, this is a Harley Davidson Pan American. Pan America. Pan America. Harley Davidson Pan America. And what's special, there's, you know, you've been probably seeing on YouTube and Instagram, there's been a lot of different riders, a lot of different adventure riders have been riding the Pan America, the, Har the new Harley adventure bike. And, you know, you see them going through some obstacle courses. Maybe you see a few thing on a racetrack somewhere. But none of those, none of those motorcycles or those videos have done what this motorcycle has done under the piloto, as we like to say in Spanish, under the piloting, the, the navigating of Chris Foster. So let's really get into it. Chris Foster is just back a few hours ago from a Guinness Book World Record ride. Maybe you saw my earlier video where we got him just before he left, and I'm so happy that I got him to be here right when he got back. Chris, what did you do? What is the Guinness Book of World Records? Well, I went to all the national parks in the lower 48 in one continuous trip on a motorcycle. <laughs> what? How did you do that? Uh, park by park. Okay. And uh, I started in, uh, I started here, went up to Joshua Tree, went to Death Valley, and I won't add the other ones in, but got them all um, and, be, and was sure to get all 51 of them in the lower 48. I couldn't go to Alaska because Canada was closed at that time. Um, and couldn't go to like Samoa and Hawaii because there's a little bit of a uh, water obstacle between them. There's a little bit of a water obstacle, yes. Yeah. So lower 48 or CONUS as we like to say, the continuous, or if you want, you could say continental, but check it out. So this motorcycle and Chris have been, since I interviewed him here back in July, have been to 51 U.S. National parks. Now, national parks, I mean, there's a lot of different uh, protected areas in the United States. There's national monuments, there's recreation areas, all that. But we're talking specifically the big boys, the big daddies of, uh, of our national park system, the national parks. There are 51, right? That's 51. 51. 51. Um, so how many days did it take you to do this? 54. So that's, so if I, I'm not really good at math, but that's almost like a park a day? Yep. Did you ever take this motorcycle to two parks in one day? Yes. Okay, where? Uh, Utah. Utah. There's more national parks per in this dense area in Utah than anywhere else in the country. So and in California. And in Because California. California's got the most parks out of any state. Do they? Mm -hmm. Okay. So out of that um, out of that journey, we're going to want to talk about the motorcycle itself, but just the endurance to spend. 54 days going to 51 national parks. Is there any state that does not have a national park? Oh, a lot of them. Okay. I mean, almost half of the states don't have a national park. Okay, so did, so you had to travel through states on this 54 day journey through 30, 51 parks. You had to travel through some states that had no parks. A lot of states. So the Eastern Seaboard was probably the, the furthest distance because I left Virginia and the next park's in Maine. Okay, so Virginia <laughs> to Maine, you had that big gap. Right. Wow. Um, so I know that you were also chasing weather a little bit. And I want to talk a bit because you and I were exchanging messages on, uh, on email and texting as you were doing this amazing landmark Guinness Book of World Record guy right here, Chris Foster. You had a little bit of a problem with some weather. You were chasing a little bit of a, well, you, you, wanted, you didn't want to be a tornado chaser. I guess you just decided you want to be a hurricane chaser. Tell us what happened down in Florida and the challenges of the national parks down there? Well, yeah, I'm from Southern California, as you know, so I'm not big into weather or have knowledge of weather. So <clears throat> the Hurricane Elsa moved in while I was down there. And we came back from Dry Tortugas, the national park there, and they closed the harbor down. And I got out the next morning. I was like a day and a half away from the hurricane, but I found out that hurricanes don't sleep at night. 
So by the time I got, I was up to, I wanted to get to Connecticut. Oh, my home state! <laughs> I grew up and born there! And I, hey, Connecticut! Because I was kind of thinking about making it through New, New Jersey, New York, and Connecticut. You know, they're all pretty close. The, tri the tri-state areas we refer to. <laughs> so I'm trying to get through there, and the tornado finally, uh, the hurricane finally caught up to me there. And it was just dumping down weather, fierce, and I had to stop in New Jersey and wait it out there and throw in an extra day, just sitting there waiting for it to go by. Waiting for the waiting for weather. We know all of us world riders have uh, have experienced that thing. But I want to go back to Tortuga for a minute because not a lot of people even know about this national park. I mean, a lot of people don't know a lot of them. You've become now a de facto expert. Tell us about Tortuga, what it took to get there. If that hurricane had come in, you would have, your whole Guinness Book World Record, you know, uh, attempt would have been shattered right there. So how did that work out for you? What challenges did you find? Well, it was difficult to schedule things ahead of time. And that's one of the things you need a ticket for because you got to get out on a boat. And of course, so where is Tortuga and how far is it? And what? All, all the way to the end of the Florida Keys. And then you got to take a boat of three to four hours from the Keys out into the ocean okay and get to it there <laughs> now can you put a motorcycle on that boat no not so at this all. is this is strictly tortuga is an island right only available for pedestrians that's right and um, or I boat mean, or boat or airplane or boat or airplane so yeah. you can fly an airplane there and there and how many starbucks are on uh, tortuga <laughs> uh that'd be zero <laughs> <laughs> how many mcdonald's uh, that'd be zero uh how many malls they ain't much there. <laughs> okay, so tell us about Tortuga because it's an interesting story. How did that island, four hours off the Keys, the Florida uh, Keys, become a national park? Um, well, the, the tour guide told us that it became a national park because there was a treasure hunter that some of you may be familiar with um, that went out there and he spent his whole life hunting treasure and uh, a lot of his family members died doing it. And he finally, I think it's about the last 10 or 15 years, he discovered he got like a half a million, oh, I'm sorry, $500 million of treasure off one of these ships. And that then, was sunk around Tortuga. Yep. And then the government came in and he was involved in a lawsuit for many years and he eventually won and had to pay a little bit of tax on it. But after that, they declared that entire area, which isn't just the island, right. it's an entire zone out there where there's hundreds if not thousands of sunken ships they declared that a national park. So now it's all off limits. Whatever's under the water belongs to the U.S. government. So do people go there and actually scuba dive? To hey, go? I went snorkeling there. You, you, went can, snorkeling. you can snorkel there. Beautiful water. Uh, you know, beautiful uh, tropical water. There's a lot of coral reefs and things like that. So okay. Um, this is in the obviously this is in the Caribbean here, mm -hmm. or is it in the Atlantic? It's the Caribbean Sea, right? I think it's yeah. I think you move into the Caribbean there. Okay, so Tortuga, which I think remind, isn't that doesn't that mean turtle in some language? That's right? it. Yep. Turtle, right? <laughs> or like a terrapin for my uh, my Grateful Dead fans out there. there and go. it was uh, it's dry because they didn't have they had a severe lack of water. Okay, so, but here it is, though. You were going out there on a boat, four hours. Elsa is coming in. Did you ever think for a moment that you might not make it? Yes, I had some reservations at the beginning, um, but uh, they assured us they could get in before it came. They were tracking it. And, and But when I came back, they closed the harbor. With it, less than an hour later, they closed the entire harbor for good. Nobody was allowed out of the harbor. Where, which harbor is this? Where's uh, the harbor in... Uh, in Key West. In Key, okay, yeah, so, you so leave, we landed back in Key West, harbor got closed. Okay, so you leave Key West. For those of you who want to go to Tortuga National Park, do some snorkeling. Uh, you won't find Starbucks or any fast food out there. Thank God you will find some nice fish uh, swimming in the ocean there and maybe a sunken treasure if you can, but you can't take anything with you, only pictures. Now another uh, milestone in your experience. A lot of us can say, for me, I, I've been to Sudan, you know, I've been to the Nubian Desert, he's been to Tortuga. A lot of people also buy lottery tickets, because sometimes getting into these places, like maybe going to Tortuga, you have to have a ticket. A ticket you say you have a greater chance of getting struck by lightning than you have of getting winning the lottery. You had some weather, and what's up with the lightning incident? Tell us about that. Well, I'm driving in Ohio, going to uh, Cuyahoga National Park, and uh, just driving down, and again, Southern California guy, not really into this, and I'm driving down, I can see the storm coming, and it's getting darker and darker, and then I can see lightning, so I think, I better get off this, and I'm on one of those toll roads, so there's no off. And so, rain is just dumping fiercely, 
and I'm watching it and I'm going about 40 miles an hour and I can see the lightning getting closer and, and all of a sudden just a big flash near me and uh, I can feel the electricity go up my hand through my through my wrist to my uh, elbow and up to my shoulder and then by the time I got up here my whole body sort of just buzzed and I got the lightning hit me. So a lot of times people say, was it your right hand? It was my right hand because okay, so, I was holding onto the brake. Because you were holding onto the brake. Because you know, a lot of people say if you ever get that pain in the left arm, that's a sign of a heart attack in your left side. Oh. Yeah, but on your right side, if you ever get that and you're in a storm with lightning, the chances are it could be lightning. Oh my God, but you lived. Yep, stayed on the bike. Uh, the bike got... Uh, so did the bike actually act as a ground or... Uh, or I mean, I don't, I don't know the science of this. <laughs> well, I read up on it. I okay. should probably I should have done it before rather than after. Yeah. But in a car, you have a uh, Faraday cage, is what they call it, or an airplane. So it's not the rubber that insulates you. The the cage over the car or the airplane dissipates the electricity over a large surface area, but not on a motorcycle. Okay, so what what saved you on the motorcycle? Um, the physician in the emergency room said the motorcycle took most of the hit. So you did go to the hospital. Yep. On the motorcycle? No. In, in an ambulance? <laughs> I went in a, I uh, Ubered it. Oh, Stopped okay. in a hotel, checked in a hotel. and Uber Ubered. ambulance. <laughs> and went to the went to the hospital. What'd they do? Um, EKG, little counseling telling me not to ride when there's uh, thunder and lightning storms, which happened about 50% of the trip. So he makes his way out to Tortuga looking for sunken treasure, gets struck by lightning all on an attempt to get a Guinness Book of World Record for being the only person to ever go to all 51 national parks in the continental U.S., CONUS, lower 48, however you want to refer to that. Uh, and he did this in 54 days. Did you ever feel like you needed more time? There's a lot of places I want to go back and explore. Um, so I, Such as what? Um, the, I really like, since this is a bike that can go on and off-road, when I was able to go off-road through the parks, I would have liked to spend a lot of time and just explore all around the parks and all the back roads that they've got in some of the national parks. There are national parks you can drive on dirt roads. On dirt roads, particularly in southern Utah. Let, let's, let's kind of unpack a bit more of that um, experience as national parks and we want to talk about the, the Harley Davidson adventure bike. I've probably been to maybe 20. I'm gonna guess 20. I should put the list together. National parks. I love national parks. We all know the biggies, Yosemite, Yellowstone. Is the Grand Tetons, is that a... Uh, that's a national park. That's a national park, that's another one. Obviously in Zion, Bryce, Canyonlands, all of those great things down in, in there. But, but what national park surprised you most and that you really then, as you were leaving, looking in the rear view mirror of your Harley Davidson Pan America, on your way to your next park for 51 day, 54 days, 51 parks, you're like, damn, I wish I could stay longer there. Canyon Lands and Capitol Reef. Those will be two of the ones I'll go back to. They're close here and they deserve a lot more time exploring. And when I was in Capitol Reef, I got in, but they had flash flood warnings because again, another thunderstorm and you're in the canyon and you gotta get out before the storm hits. Right, because otherwise you just end up getting taken down a, a very fast river. Yeah. Right, right. Um, so this thing, this is the Harley Davidson Pan America. Do you mind if I just go ahead and... Uh, no, have a go. Uh, check this. This is the Harley Davidson Pan America adventure bike. 1250 cc's. Chris, seems a little big. It's a big, it's a full size, yeah, it's a full size adventure bike. Full size. So, uh, so does that mean that when I ride is a half size? No. <laughs> it, it, no. It, it, what's a half size one then? <laughs> I don't know, 600, I guess, because this is a 1250. So, you know, it's, it's, it feels a little big, but it's got the, uh, it's got an interesting suspension on it. So it goes two inches lower when it's sitting still. Okay. And then when you move after nine miles an hour, it raises up another couple inches, two inches. And so then you get the clearance you need for the off-road. Okay, so real quick, uh, beyond the suspension, what are some of the, the, the things about this motorcycle that you truly uh, found yourself liking? Oh no, you have other motorcycles, right? So tell us a little bit about some of your other motorcycles and then tell us what you like about this compared to the others. Um, well, in this same range, um, I've got a BMW GS. Okay. Uh, very similar. Um, love the power on it. So it's got a lot of torque. Um, and a lot of power. It's got 150 horsepower. Um, and it, you know, when you need to get up and go, it gets up and goes. Um, 
very, very good. And you can adjust um, through the computer, you can adjust the engine management on it to, to suit how you want to act. You can adjust the engine management on right. it. Right. Can you do that on your GS? Not sure on the new ones. But the one you have, you can't. You cannot. So that that's something that you you like on this. What else is is? Uh, uh, love the suspension. So it's got uh, it's got that suspension I told you the up and down. But when you add weight to it, or when you add a rider to it, it automatically adjusts for that. So did you ever ride pillion on this ride or with a two up with anybody? I have. Not okay. on this trip, not on this trip, but I have. Yeah, but you, you tested it out. Mm -hmm. Okay. What about the the gearing? Because in a uh, in an off road environment, that first and second gear is where you really you, 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 this is where you play the game a lot of times, in, in at least a technical and difficult terrain. It's got the it's got a real first gear. Um, it's also got a chain and sprocket, so if you want to change the gearing, there's no problem. Just okay. swap out swap out the sprockets. And, and adjust the chain, you can change the gearing on. So a lot of Harley Davidsons use belt drives, right? right? Mm -hmm. um, this, this is a traditional chain and sprocket. Traditional chain and sprocket. Okay. How many? Uh, how, how how about maintenance on the trip? So how many miles do you go and clean and lube the chain? Um, I lubed it probably um, every three to four thousand miles, and I found out the lifespan of the chain because I wasn't really sure before I left. But it, it's going to last about twenty-five thousand miles. Here. Really? Yeah. Is this the original? This is the original chain from the bike when it was new. I, I, I don't even get half of that on my chain on my GS right. on my my Dakar. Mm -hmm. Is there some sort of built-in lubrication system? It's an O-ring chain, so it's got the O-ring chains have a lubrication right. built even in. Even when I use O-ring chain, I, there's no way I get twenty-five thousand miles. I can't believe it. You only lubed it every three or four thousand miles. About. Yeah, it depended. It depended on the terrain. If it if it was uh, going through a lot of dirt and sand, I tried to get it clean and then lube it. So a lot of rain, whatever. It just depended on what condition the chain was in. Okay. Okay. So let's talk a little bit more about the technology. I know that this has a TFT um, screen. Looks like it's probably maybe five by seven, six by nine. Um, yeah, all motor. My motorcycle still got an analog tack and an analog. Uh, speedometer, but uh, this is this is the future, like our cars. Um, how did it handle in the in the weather? And are there any kind of cool little tech geeky features for our geeks out there that might be interested? <laughs> um, let's see. It handled great in the weather. Never a problem with it. Always readable. Um, I know they're uh, doing a uh, adjustment on the font because the font's a little small to read especially when you're moving and it's raining and so on and so forth. But it's got everything you need. It's fairly intuitive going through, um, going through the different screens. It's got more information that you probably need or want to go through. Um, a lot of stuff's adjustable. Um, it also has, you can go and check the fault codes on it. So the fault code comes up like on my car. Oh, you don't need to plug in the thing? No, you can go see what the fault codes are and you can read them and you can reset them and see if they'll reset. So see if you've got a problem or if it's just a temporary fault in the fault So you, if, if it's just a temporary port, port, you can actually reset your codes right there. Yes. That That is cool. Yeah. Uh, okay, I see the uh, windscreen is adjustable. Is that manual or is that got a motor? No, nope, it's manual. It's manual, okay. Yep. Some of those BMWs have little motors. Um, okay, so what do you not like? What would you like to see Harley change in this in the next edition, if you will. I would like this. I'd like every vehicle I own to have Apple Kit, Apple Play, or Android. Oh, CarPlay. Yeah. Or yeah, Android. CarPlay or Android. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. this doesn't have it. it. Doesn't have it. So, but you can plug in your iPhone to it. Um, it doesn't read. It doesn't read to the iPhone. No. Okay. Okay. What did you use for navigation? My phone. Which is That's Google Google Maps. I use Google, Google Maps. Maps, but it does have a built-in navigation system where you can download maps and you can use the proprietary software that they've got. Okay. But I'm just so used to Google Maps, it was an easy default for me. Okay, so let's talk, talk about the luggage system that, that this used. Did you actually, uh, when you were staying for the night, I'm, I'm curious, did you camp? And did you stay in hotels? And if when you stayed in hotels, did you bring your luggage in? Or how did you manage your whole system of of gear. You so know. in this particular box, this is smaller because that's the side of the exhaust, so it's a little smaller on this uh, right side. Right on the um, starboard side. Right. I, <laughs> I had all of my tools, tire repair kit, pump, uh, sleeping bag, mattress pad, and sleeping bag. Everything for camping was in that one box. So that, if I wasn't camping, didn't need to get opened. 
this one had um, all of my personal stuff, hiking shoes, um, all my clothing, toiletries in this side. What I would do is I'd just put it in a little carrier bag, like something you take your groceries with, and I just pull that out. And that back one had all my food and water and electronics. And I carried a lot of water. I carried like three or four liters of water every day uh, okay. to make sure I was properly hydrated. So that had the food, water, and all the electronics in okay. the back part. Okay, what about the tank bag? Um, that had all the stuff that I could grab and go, so like wallet, you know, um, all the valuable stuff, and a um, 35 millimeter uh, digital SLR. So okay, so yeah, you, you carried actual. What about your phone? Did you mount it to the handlebars? Did you leave it here? How'd you, how did you, you're using the phone for navigation. Yeah, I, You've got to be able to see it. I mounted it uh, on the handlebar with a quad lock mount. Okay, you use a quad lock mount, which is taken off, because this motorcycle now, now that you've finished this, this was a, a loaner, right? Yes. A, a Harley Davidson was kind enough to loan it to Chris for this world record ride. She's going back to the stable. She's going back to the stable, yeah. <laughs> so, as you were traveling, I know you are moving really quick. Did you have any opportunities to meet with media and talk about this, wow, amazing record that you broke? I did. You know, I met with, uh, my second park I went to was Death Valley, and it was 127 degrees. The media was there. Um, just because it was hot. They wanted to see who was going to show up in Death Valley when it was 127. Okay, when you say it's hot, how hot? 127. 127 degrees in Death Valley. I think for the Europeans, that's 53 or 54 degrees. 53 or 50 <laughs> degrees centigrade Celsius. What? I mean, this is a this is a water-cooled engine. Water-cooled. So what if that was an airhead? I don't know. I, yeah, I don't know how it would work. <laughs> and 127 degrees. Okay, but yeah, we were you know we got water cooled. Uh, we're not in the vintage area here. Wow. Okay. So in addition to CarPlay, the font size on here, what else do you think Harley should look at in terms of improving this motorcycle? Because right now, I think I'd probably say how many miles did you go? Uh, the bikes I put about twenty five thousand on it. The parks I put about twenty thousand. So twenty thousand. So you probably have more experience than most anyone right now because this bike just came out in the spring or early summer, right? Who's got more experience than you? So you are like a little, you know, I mean, you're like the test, you're the, the, the beta tester. What are you gonna tell them to fix? I had a lot of questions from people on the road. In fact, other people had, had bought it since I left and asked me like about the seat and everything like that. Um, I think the big thing I would want on it is um, Apple Play. But Carly. that's just techno, what about the bike? What about the, 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 the geometry, the wheels, the the power band, the, the gearing? I mean, what else? I mean, uh, you're, you're, how many motorcycles do you own? The only couple. The only, the only he owns, couple. Look, he's, being, he's, he's got at least 10 back there. I'm telling um, you, man. He's got a Ducati in his living room right here. I mean, this guy's got bikes. He knows. What are we going to do to improve this? The side stand's a little bit wonky um, because, it's, uh, because the suspension, and I don't know technically how to address this, but... The guy's smarter than we do. It's um, it's a little wonky because the suspension's two inches lower than normal because they've got that great suspension That's on it, so it's two inches lower than normal. So it's it's got sort of a high point where you got to pull it out, and the foot isn't really wide enough to stick it in the dirt or the mud. You know, the, the uh, surface area should be two or three times larger on the foot. This it goes into the, the dirt or gravel or mud. I agree because now as I'm looking down at this, and, and for those of you who followed my journeys, you know how I've fought and battled my kickstand on my F650 GS Dakar, uh, which I guess now I'm learning is a, is a half-size adventure bike. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I, I, it's pretty full for me. <laughs> the other thing looking down at this that I think, Chris, they could do, these, these foot pegs look like they're half-size. They're puny. Look at these! Look at that! I mean, that looks like something you have on your mini bike. <laughs> I, I I never took notice of it when I was riding it, but I had another person say that. Really? To me. Yeah. Yeah. They, they they are they are they are just there, and it's it does have a center stand. It's see, yeah, that's not standard, but this particular one does, and I'd suggest that because it's infinitely easier to loop the chain if you got a center stand. And how easy is it to get up on the center stand? It's okay. It's not. It's I mean, because it's, it's a big bike. It's because even though you get it lower, because right. if, if you imagine it's harder, you know, you don't have that leverage. It's, it's much harder for me because my bike is so high. It's like a two-man job right. to, right. to, to get it on the center stand. Oh, speaking of a Harley, here we go. Yeah, there you go. Exactly. Even even the 
dog now is a little pissed off over here. You get all the sounds here in Southern California of the day on uh, this beautiful August day. Okay, so as we just heard the traditional sound of a Harley, how does this thing sound? Doesn't sound like a traditional. Can we start it up? Can we start this thing up? Okay, Chris, let's just start this thing up. Let's hear how this sounds compared to that bike we just heard it here. So I guess the real question is for you Harley riders out there, for you cruisers, some people would say, and I've seen their comments online, they can be pretty nasty for some people, they don't call this a Harley Davidson. But it is, isn't it? Yes. Absolutely. It's made in... USA. Milwaukee. <laughs> it's made in Milwaukee, just like your fat boy, your soft tail, your, I don't know, whatever your, you know, what, 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 your sportster. If you were, except, oh yeah, they, uh, they just put this engine in the sportster. It's called the sportster S. The sportster S. Yeah. This engine. Yeah. So what do they call this? Is this the Pan American engine? Or do they call this the, 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 the Olution? Uh, do they have a fancy name for it? We'll figure it out. We'll put it down here. <laughs> Um, okay, so we, would you go ahead and recommend this bike to a new adventure rider? Brand new adventure rider that's never had an adventure bike? Yeah, but it's maybe a motorcyclist, you know? Oh, okay, so some guy with experience? Yeah, I would recommend it. Okay. And I, I didn't have, I mean, I kind of entered without any expectations, and I was pleasantly surprised. I've never owned a Harley, uh, but this carried me well on this trip and performed above expectations. Above expectations. Well above. Okay, so um, how can people get a hold of you? Where, where, what's your social media channels? They want to follow you. You're, you don't just do national parks. How, how many countries have you traveled on, a, on an adventure bike to? Um, six of the seven continents. He's been on six of the seven continents, at least 40 countries, right? At least 40 countries, yes. At least. He's actually been to Mongolia. Um, Siberia. Siberia. So how can people follow you? Planet Earth Quest. Planet Earth Quest on Instagram and Twitter? Yes. Planet Earth Quest. Chris Foster, Guinness Book record holder for traveling to 51 national parks in 54 days. The only person to ever do it. All of them continuously and contiguously. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Alan. Appreciate you uh, spending time. And that, uh, you go, how do you feel now? Where are you, you going to go next? I feel like going to get a massage or something. <laughs> I'm actually going to Europe for another motorcycle ride. See, right, right. See, this guy is the real thing. World rider, Chris Foster. Thank you for tuning into my YouTube channel. If you haven't subscribed yet, click that little subscribe button, hit the bell for notifications, and I'll see you on the next one, whether it's in the backyard of my house or somewhere in an exotic place around the world. I love you guys. See you in the next one. This is Alan. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe to my channel.